Ja, zack, sehe es, das Grüne läuft aus. Und checkt, da kommt die Kamera. Das ist die. Und ich würde eigentlich funktionieren, weil ich sehe, dass es wirklich gut. Okay, okay. Aber wenn du willst, können wir noch nachchecken, dass wir mit der schnell mit dir eine Verbindung machen. Ich glaube, das funktioniert. Ja, ich glaube, das funktioniert. Tipptopp.
Perfect. Great. Hopefully everyone can hear me a little bit better now. Uh, lots of opportunities to go online for our consumers and our patients. Many of those illegal online drug sellers take advantage of an increasingly global and fractured supply chain. I don't have time to go over this in detail, um, but as you all are probably well aware, our supply chain is flawed. Those illegal online drug sellers, those uh, sellers that particularly sell substandard or falsified otherwise counterfeit medicines, and they do that about 10 to 40% of the time, sell medicines that contain a lot of things we don't want in them, including heavy metals, actual poisons, common household items, drugs you didn't ask for. In the United States specifically, we're having significant issues with fentanyl-laced products that are harming and killing our patients every single day. Many of them are manufactured, air quotes, in places that look like this, completely unsanitary conditions uh, that we would never want to take medicines from. Clearly, health professionals have a role here. This is a significant medicine as well as global patient safety issue. Unfortunately, are healthcare providers discussing online pharmacies? The short answer is no. This is a national or taken from a national survey we did in the United States back in 2019. I show nurses, pharmacists, and physicians on here. Let's call out pharmacists specifically because we're the medication use experts. The vast majority of their time, 71% of the time, we never even talk about this issue with our patients, which is um, significantly impacting them every single day. When we do talk about it, about half of the people who talk about it say, go for it. Without any safeguards in place, the other half do highlight the risks. Also taken from that work that we did in 2019, greater than 50% of licensed pharmacists in the United States are not confident on their knowledge on prevalence of illegal internet pharmacies, their ability to determine the legitimacy of one. So if your patient showed you a website, is this legitimate or is it not? Or the types of medicines sold on those websites. Thus, in the short uh, time I have left to talk about a recent research study that we did, we needed to better assess the gaps in knowledge of our learners, our students who are going out into practice, and how do we better educate those doctor or pharmacy students in the United States on this issue. To achieve those objectives, we employed the following methods. A pre and post survey was used, which was determined to be exempt via IRB review. Participation was voluntary, and the data was collected using an electronic questionnaire. We took a baseline survey. We did a educational two-hour module, and then we did a post survey just to see if a small amount of education would make a significant interest or um, would improvement in their ability to both identify as well as counsel on illegal online pharmacies. And here are some of the results from that pilot study. We had 102 students in the pre, 100 in the post. It is voluntary. We can't force people to complete those surveys. In the pre-survey, 87% indicated some awareness that this was a problem. So we have a vast majority of people that know it's an issue, but most, 89%, do not believe they are provided adequate education and current curricula to actually positively impact. After receiving education, so this is taken from the post survey, 64% stated they now felt their education was adequate. Not great, but certainly better. So we went from 11% saying they were comfortable up to 64%. In terms of practical application, we actually showed those students legal and illegal websites and said, okay, before education, is it legal or illegal? And then we did the same thing after education. So the top row, that's an illegal website. Before education, 35% of respondents said that that website was illegal, which was correct. After education, that jumped to 82%. The bottom is a legal, a legal website, a legal, not illegal, a legal website. 25% said it was legal and then up to 33%. We did shift a lot of that unable to determine data. A few key takeaways that I'd love to leave for you today. Uh, pharmacy students currently at least as part of our pilot project, are, the, are aware of the existence of illegal online pharmacies, but are not aware of the significance of this as a global patient safety issue and do not know how to accurately identify suspicious websites. These topics are increasingly important in an internet-based economy. This impacts everyone globally, and this has only been exacerbated due to the current COVID-19 pandemic. Pharmacy programs around the world should consider incorporating formal education on this topic to supplement more traditional substandard falsified counterfeit medical training. 
With that, there are a lot of partners globally that are very active in this issue. This is just a sampling of those up here. I certainly appreciate your time, your attention, uh, and the opportunity to present today, and I welcome any questions that you might ask. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? I thank you for the presentation. I'm Federico from University of Minnesota. Uh, do you know how many schools of pharmacy in the US do some training about online pharmacies or maybe you're the first who did a two hours lecture? Sure. What's your opinion about it? Yeah, Th thank you very much for that question. Um, we did a survey of schools of pharmacy within the United States. There are, are many of them. I think we captured about 152 in our survey. At the time we did that back in 2018, 2019, 35 of those did some type of training on substandard falsified or counterfeit medicines, either part of basic pharmaceutics or pharmacy practice. Um, a small fraction, like less than five, mentioned online pharmacies. And that, that to me, obviously, I think needs to change. Uh, when we think about substandard and falsified medicines and supply chain issues, I think historically, when I went through pharmacy school, we thought about uh, more lower and middle income countries suffering particularly from that issue. Now with the advent of a global economy, e-commerce, now it knows no borders, knows no boundaries, and it's affecting both lower and middle as well as high income countries. Thank you. Thank you, John. So the students now have a better knowledge through your um, intervention. My question is, do you know what they will do with this knowledge? How will they, will they change a behavior or what will the students do now? Yeah, thank you. And that, that really is probably the most important question, right? Because how are you going to use this to actually directly impact patient care, either at the bedside or at the counter? Um, I have been really promoting this idea of, of asking. So we ask, you know, how did the doctor tell you to take this medicine? You know, did, what are you taking it for? I think at least in places like the United States, engaging in another question, which is where do you get your medication from? is a big question for us because we have a very um, diverse way of getting medicines in the United States. And so you could get it from one pharmacy, another across the street, you could order it online from a legitimate pharmacy. And unless you ask that question, you're not gonna have that opportunity to intervene. Because if they say, oh, I get this from you here, but I also go across the street to a competitor, that, that's fine, you know, as long as you're getting it from a legitimate source. But if you answer, oh, you know what, uh, because of access or convenience, I'm now going to canadadrugs.com, which was shut down by the US FBI and the owners um, indicted, you know, I'm going to have a little follow up question around why did you do that? Can I help you access them safely? Did you know that 10 to 40% of medicines that are coming out of these Canadian online pharmacies? My question is what will your students do? Did you continue on that or is it just a one shot? I see. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. Uh, this is now incorporated as part of our formal curriculum at Butler University. We actually expanded that to the entire state of Indiana, which is two additional schools. And the idea being this type of uh, work will then um, inform standards in the United States so that this topic is then incorporated formally in curricula countrywide. So thank you for that clarification. Yes. Are there any more questions? Thank you, Christiane from Berlin. Um, I have a question. If you can go two back, maybe also I didn't see it correctly. What struck me was that you said in the lower two diagrams, you have a um, decrease in the unable to determine, mm -hmm. but it increased very much also the illegal section, which is not correct, actually. So maybe also was my impression, maybe students were insecure about judging yeah. actually and said better illegal than to say yeah. correctly it's legal. Your, your very astute observation um, down here, yes, the unable to determine did decrease, but um, they incorrectly identified the website as an illegal website here. S certainly, so they are incorrect, but I'd rather them be incorrect in this way mm -hmm. th than the alternative, because at least they are 
uh, more sensitive to the issues of illegal online pharmacies. Now, what I don't want to have happen and say, you know what, that website is illegal. Have a nice day, right? It's, I don't really know, or I think it's illegal, but here are other safe sources of medicine that I know I can point you to so that that access is maintained. I think that's the key message there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I have screenshots of all these different websites and it it is very challenging to to determine actually. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we have to go to the next presenter. Thank you so much, John, for that presentation. <laughs> And he's all here for questions afterwards, I guess. <laughs> no. <clears throat> Musen's up. And now to present uh, um, using machine learning methods to predict all cause somatic hospital admissions and readmissions in adults, a systematic review. Uh, Mr. Musen Askar. Um, okay, um, my name is Mohsen Askar. I'm a PhD student at the Arctic University of Norway. Today, I'm going to present my systematic review on how machine learning methods we use to predict uh, hospital admission and readmission, somatic hospital admission and readmission in the adult population. First, uh, it's a very complex task to predict hospital admission or readmission because it involves a lot of factors and a lot of, a lot of uh, predictors. Um, for a long time, has uh, statistical learning and especially logistic regression been the fundamental model to predict admissions and readmissions? Uh, recently, of course, machine learning um, is gaining popularity in predicting this important outcome. So, in this in this systematic review, we aim to describe how machine learning was used to evaluate the usefulness of machine learning methods, methods, and also to have some reflections and future insights. Um, we searched eight databases, four for literature and four for gay literature, and um, out of 6,388 citations, we ended up with 96 citations, uh, from which 83 articles, 10 abstracts, and the three theses. Uh, we used Picot to formulate our research question, Charmes uh, for data extraction, Tribute to uh, evaluate uh, the quality of reporting of the included studies, uh, proposed for uh, bias assessment and finally, of course, Prisma for uh, Prisma guidelines to uh, conduct this systematic review. Uh, some results, uh, there were 59% of these citations or articles dedicated for readmissions, 40 dedicated for admissions. Um, the first article we saw was from 2005 and there was a steep number of articles around 2018 reaching a peak in 2019 with about 22 articles. 55% uh, of the articles were conducted using data from the USA. The sample size varied from 371 to almost 4.5 4 million patients. And the data inclusion period varied from one month to almost three years, 30 years. The admission proportion varied from 1% to 41%, while readmission varied from 0.03 to almost 35%. In total, 48 different algorithms were used. Logistic regression is still the most used, the most frequently used algorithm. And then comes random force with about 55% of the articles. There was a clear superiority of machine learning algorithms over, over logistic regression. In about 84% of the articles, one of the machine learning algorithms outperformed logistic regression. Tree-based boosting algorithms outperform, usually outperf outperforming the other, other uh, uh, algorithms, uh, followed by random first and neur neural networks. Uh, area under the root curve was the most popular uh, used evaluation matrix with about 90% of, of uh, the articles. We also uh, noticed some poorness in some quality items of the included articles, uh, such as uh, providing local, uh, yeah. <laughs> such as providing local interpretation, I mean, uh, pre pre interpretation on the patient's level, implementing in, in practice, in clinical practice, uh, presenting full mode, a full mode, uh, model uh, or full code, 
uh, having some form of external validation, a calibration of the model, handling imbalanced data sets, and finally handling and reporting missing data, uh, missing values. When it comes to quality of reporting, generally few articles have reached the high quality of reporting, and only five of these articles reported compliance with Tribod. This, this was clearer in some categories such as um, uh, that uh, abstract uh, uh, reporting, detailed population characteristics, handling predictors, reporting sample size, and reporting limitations. It's good here to say that Tribod is a general uh, reporting uh, checklist for prediction, uh, out, uh, for prediction studies and not specialized for machine learning studies. And there is no validated checklist specialized for machine learning studies yet. Some reflections. First, no algorithm constantly performs better than the others. Data types has, of course, its effect on the performance. So we saw that using discharge data usually outperforms using admission data. Combining administrative and clinical data yield best results, but we saw also that in some contexts and some populations, um, using either administrative or clinical data sets can also yield good results. There is a need to develop a checklist, reporting checklist, specialized for machine learning studies, uh, the most common analysis problem we saw in these articles was uh, dealing with the temporal variables, dealing with the uh, high uh, dimensional hierarchical variables, and dealing, of course, with longitudinal patient data. Uh, researchers must provide patient level interpretation of their model if they want to implement their model in the clinical practice and also to overcome um, the low trust among clinicians towards machine learning. We're still far from generalizing machine learning models, either national, on the national level or the international level. This is enhanced by many factors like different data formats, uh, lacking of infrastructure needed for that, and many other things. So we recommend institution-specific models rather going for national or international uh, approaches. We also believe that implementing machine learning models to predict admissions in community pharmacies, uh, beside it will reduce the admissions, and of course, also it it, uh, it will enhance the role of community pharmacists as a gateway keeper between uh, primary and secondary uh, healthcare services. Thank you. Thank you, Mosin. Any questions for Mosin? Just the easy question. <laughs> Thank you very much. So you were this morning in the workshop of Karen. You've heard a lot about realistic and all these factors. And oh no, so not sorry, factors. Yeah. Um, tell me the name. Mechanism, whatever. Will you reanalyze a little bit your results in light of Karen's input? Because if I'm right, you just say it's all rubbish. No, 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 no. I say uh, I'm saying it's just still in the developing stage, right? It's not well. Um, well, the, the methodology is well established, but using it like that in the clinical outcomes is still needs still much, much more things to do. Uh, we also maybe I didn't mention that here, but um, uh, we saw also that uh, it's very difficult to agree on the factors because different data sets, some of them just use the Admit as at all discharge data or admission data or just medication or just diagnosis or just the clinical notes or so it was so heterogeneous these articles to to say, but um, as I always say that machine learning model yeah, we uh, there is some kind of overestimation of machine learning machine learning is not magic, you give right data you get right outcome you give wrong data you get wrong outcome. You want generalization, you have to give the, mod the model a generalized data set, not just a specific data set to a specific population. You can't imagine that a model can give you results for adults when you give it pediatric uh, data set, for example. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I think. <laughs> You know, the Arena's approach may help you in finding out why people may use one to or not trust machine learning or not use it later. But I think for you, it's really data and statistical methods, isn't it? And right. I, what I can see is the problem is algorithms are protected. You don't learn from each other to start with. So as you said, you know, often they don't publish their algorithms. So it's very hard Some then to are... find out, yeah, you right. know, right. which are the better performing ones Right. you know, or what were the data sets um, they used. So I think it's it's a field where maybe due to commercial pressures or 
patents, you may even be um, hindered in learning from each other. Of course, if you have commercial mm -hmm. purposes, then you, you won't, of course, uh, publish your algorithms protected by regulations and uh, contracts. Then I have a question about your last line. Uh, how you plan to implement uh, machine learning into community pharmacies, which is mostly privately owned? Yes, good, good question. Um, uh, pharmacies have enough data to can predict from because it has medication data, it has diagnosis data, it has uh, some administrative variables, it has demographics, a lot of a lot of sources of data. Uh, pharmacy also the low threshold uh, service as we can, so it's the the easiest way to to the customer to come, and it has a huge amount of data. Deploying these these models in in um, uh, in community pharmacies on the national way, of course, needs some regulations and need like an infrastructure for that. But we can test these models if we can. Yeah, because from my from my point of view, the most difficult thing with machine learning was generalizing it is getting the data because you have to wait a lot of time and you have if you want big data, then you have to to um, to apply many different places and, and have to wait and then you have to gather all these if you can gather them, if you can match them. So that's just 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 the thought to involve the community, but I don't have a complete <laughs> imagination this yet. Thank you. Anything? More questions? Musin is also her rest of the day. Of <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> the next presenter is uh, Dr. Kati Heimanen Attila, if I said it right. <laughs> Um, she's presenting um, her project, the, qual the quality of over-the-counter medication counseling in Finnish pharmacy, a simulated patient study. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Katriha Menantila, and I'm the head of research and development from the Finnish Medicines Agency. And I'm presenting today on behalf of my PhD student, Nina, who got ill just before the Congress and couldn't join us here today. Uh, as we all know, uh, medication counseling provided by the pharmacist uh, is very important for ensuring the safe use of medicines, and this is especially true when it comes to self-medication. So our aim was to study the quality of OTC medication counseling in Finnish pharmacies. And we used the simulated uh, a patient method with three scenarios. The first one was a uh, normal OTC medicine uh, ibuprofen uh, called Purana. Uh, and the second one was a uh, Pronoxen case, uh, including Naproxen uh, product. Uh, it's a behind the counter medicine, which means that the pharmacists need to counsel um, following the protocol by the marketing authorization holder. And the third scenario was nasal spray scenario, uh, and the patient simply asked for a nasal spray. We took a random sample of 150 pharmacies. We have all together uh, around 600 pharmacies in Finland. Um, and uh, the pharmacies were visited twice, one year in between. And we ended up all together 292 visits that were analyzed. And the patient um, documented electronically the uh, whole uh, process that were, went uh, in the uh, pharmacy, uh, and we did not record the visits. Here you can see the uh, coding system uh, or scoring system that we created. Uh, this is for Purana Gaze. Uh, and we had two categories, need assessments and instructions for use. And both of these categories uh, included subcategories and the related uh, questions and advice that the pharmacist should give. And this is the same for our second uh, scenario, Pronaxen, with uh, two categories and subcategories and related questions and advice. And finally, the nasal spray scenario. Each of the scenarios could um, have a maximum of six uh, points or scores. 
uh, and we gave one score if uh, the pharmacist uh, advised or asked at least one of these questions and zero scores if there were no questions or uh, advice. And we define the quality of counseling as uh, poor with one to two points, moderate to three to point, four points and high five to six points. Going to results, uh, in all of these three uh, scenarios, the quality of patient counseling was high in about 30% of the visits, but it was very clear that the most difficult one was the Purana case. Uh, the quality of counseling was classified at least moderate in half of the uh, Pronaxen and NASA spray scenarios, but in the Purana case, the ibuprofen case, the counseling quality was poor in 20% of the cases, and they were actually not at all counseling in 65% of the cases. Uh, when we look at the distribution of the scores, you can see that uh, the best uh, uh, case was Pronaxen, having the most uh, high uh, high scores, but you can also see that even with the very difficult Purana case, there were one pharmacist who actually got all the points, so it is possible to give high quality counseling even with this case. And when we looked at the mean scores for the categories, the need assessment uh, score was the highest in the nasal spray scenario and instructions for use uh, in the Pronaxen scenario. And if we look at the content of the counseling, uh, you can see that uh, in the need assessment, uh, the symptoms were most often asked in the nasal spray scenario, which is of course very natural. And then the contraindications and drug interactions in the Purana and Pronaxen uh, scenarios. And uh, this is actually was in accordance uh, with the marketing authorization holder uh, procedure. And in the instructions for use, there were variation uh, in the content of counseling. Uh, how to use the medicine was the most counseled in the Pronaxen scenario and um, follow up in Burana and nasal spray scenarios. So we can conclude that there is definitely variation uh, in the quality of medication counseling provided in our pharmacies and that only a few pharmacies performed high quality counseling. So the, there is definitely room to improve our uh, counseling in, in Finnish pharmacies. And this is especially true when it's the patient requests an OTC uh, medicine uh, by its brand name. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, yes, we have a question. Hi, uh, Laura Zahm, University College Cork. I wonder, did you do any analysis on um, the demographics of the pharmacists that you interviewed, as in, you know, gender, years in practice, et cetera? Uh, this was actually, uh, the whole study was actually conducted so that the pharmacies did not know that they were involved in the study. Uh, we had to, of course, apply for the ethical approval um, uh, for this. Um, so we did not uh, count any demographics of the pharmacists, but we, of course, know the pharmacies that were, uh, so, so whether rural or central or and distribution, but but there were no uh, differences uh, on the results. I have a question regarding your method, um, the items or the, the points that you give and the categories. Did you use any kind of um, framework mm. to generate this? Because there's a, there's a very nice um, MR uh, CT medication related Medication related consultation framework. Did you use this yeah. to generate your items? Yeah, uh, this is actually the the limitation of our study that the scoring system was uh, based on the uh, uh, yeah the research group created it, uh, and also the scenarios that we used. Um, 
uh, they were the, the whole study uh, is conducted by the Finnish Medicines Agency. So uh, these scenarios included the need of the inspectors uh, that we have who go to the pharmacies and check if they follow the the law. So they said that this is they want this kind of uh, information to be gained from the our pseudo customer. Uh, study and that's why we developed uh, these three scenarios so these are very much in for the uh, purpose of of the Finnish pharmacies and the the uh, regulatory processes but but on the other hand uh, we of course informed the pharmacies or the Finnish pharmacies that the, this study has been done and then the pharmacies who were involved and and they got the possibility to get their own results and almost all of the pharmacies did actually uh, send us a query that, and we send out their own uh, results. Uh, so we are hoping that uh, during the time, this will also be one uh, way to develop the, the medication counseling in Finnish pharmacies. We have actually conducted um, one and published uh, or already one after this. And don't tell any Finnish pharmacies, but we are going to do another one in, in autumn. So, and, and we have now included also online pharmacies. Yeah, there we go. My view is the evaluation, yes, no, just zero or one. And this mm. is very sharp. And if you look at, the, at this framework, you will see that the evaluator, so the pseudo patient has to decide if it's able if the pharmacy is, is able a little bit, or so it's mm, a liquid yeah. scale to evaluate. And yeah. in my view, this will be more how the, re the reality is. It's not yeah. yes, no, it is do they a little bit, or you have the, the sentences that the pharmacies have to say, and this is yes, no. Yeah, so and, they, and, these were, and these were actually all the questions that, that, that the pharmacies did uh, ask. So these were, and there were no other. This was it. So the the score scores were also based on the uh, questions and under eyes that the pharmacist uh, in real world they they uh, altogether did. Yeah, because in many pharmacies they have regular users, and the pharmacists maybe know the customers, so they get really the, the information that they are giving to the patient. They get they slack on it. Mm. But these were new, yes. Yeah, and these were the over the counter. So, so we really couldn't, uh, as a governmental agency, we cannot uh, do prescription uh, pseudo customer uh, study because we had to, yeah, make wrong prescriptions. So that's not possible. <laughs> Really interesting. Thank you. Um, uh, do you. I have several questions. Is it uh, one is more? Uh, well, did it have any consequences? I mean, it's not a good result. And if you publish it and say, oh, mm -hmm. I mean, especially in these times, you say, oh, actually, just go order anyway. It doesn't really matter because you don't get any counseling in the pharmacy anyway. So this is a problem we are facing. We did some sort of customer visits, and we're always a little worried on the results. So this is the one part. The other thing is, um, do you have standards of counseling in self-medication? Um, yeah, and this is a good question. Um, uh, we are actually in the middle of um, not only healthcare reform, but also a, pharmaceutical, a ph pharmacy uh, reform. And the ministry actually uh, asked us uh, to do a report or uh, uh, about the uh, medication counseling and the what is the definition of the uh, legal medication counseling that has to uh, be counseled in the community pharmacy. It, it's stated in the uh, law that uh, in medicines act that that pharmacists have to counsel, but it is in very general level. So we. We don't have it specified what is good quality counseling uh, in Finnish pharmacies. It's uh, we cannot. So, so this was one way to to uh, classify the quality of the counseling, but we don't have a national uh, kind of a uh, reg regulation or guideline for that. Uh, in the pharmacy education, we use the uni United States uh, Pharmacopeia, uh, what is medication counseling behavior guidelines. 
and also we have a uh, yeah for the uh, following uh, the treatment follow up we have this uh, kind of a, a finished wor version uh, of what should be followed but but those are more in the prescription medicine counseling so this is something that uh, we definitely are going forward to develop the uh, guidelines for the medication counseling Thank you, Kat. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. So did these pharmacies at the beginning, did they know that they may be able to take part in this research? You yeah. informed for all the pharmacies in the country before that? No. Yeah, we actually uh, sent out a letter to all of the pharmacies that, that uh, the agency will conduct the pseudo customer study, but we will not tell uh, when and what are the scenarios and who, who the pharmacies really are involved. But after we did the, uh, conduct the study and publish the report, then we sent out uh, to the pharmacies who were visited uh, the information that you have been a part of the study. So, would they be able to, to refuse to participate in this study or not? No, no, they didn't. We we are the authority in Finland, and we are <laughs> we <laughs> can do this. <laughs> so we didn't ask for their permission. Yeah, but we had ethical approval for the uh, the study. Yeah. So. <laughs> Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Hmm. But they got a heads up. So you can argue that uh, the results even could have been poorer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, of course, we we had a lot of discussion with the pharmacies and within the pharmacy field, and uh, I presented in many uh, pharmacy uh, seminars, and the pharmacists themselves were really like, "Oh, this should, yeah, this should not be the case." Uh, but then again, uh, we did another one, and well, as you all who are familiar with the, the pseudo customer method, it depends really, really much on the scenario. So if you go with the symptom, you get better uh, advice. And if you go with the product request, that's always very hard for the pharmacists. So, so we didn't have um, a national uh, uh, problems in the na national media or anything like that. So, so it was more within the pharmacy field, which I think it's good because now we have a kind of a good chance to develop. Thank you, Katri. So then we have the last uh, presenter for this oral sessions. And um, it's Dr. Joao Gregorio. Yes, I tell it. Uh, he's presenting pharmacy services tailored to patients' health needs, design of a tool to assist pharmacies in simple medication reviews. Sorry.
So thank you uh, once again. My name is uh, João Gregor. I'm from the Lusófona University in Lisbon. So I bring you um, a work from a, a PhD student of mine, Ligia, that um, approached me with this idea of designing an algorithm for um, uh, make, for producing uh, a way of prioritizing patients in the pharmacy in order to uh, tailor the pharmacy services to their needs. So we started with the medication review. Uh, you know, medication reviews, of course, uh, um, they are aimed to detect drug related problems, and we use the framework of the PCNE. So the the four types of medication reviewed on type one type 2a type 2b so we did you we use this framework to produce to try to design a new algorithm so our approach was to make this type one medication review that is a medication review that uh, doesn't involve the presence of the patient in the pharmacy uh, through the the medication records that were in the pharmacy. We, were, we tended to identify clusters in this, this data set that would enable uh, uh, the design of an algorithm to, to in the end, uh, enable the, the tailor of um, the interventions to these patients. So it started with this medication review, extracting a, a database from a community pharmacy in Lisbon. Uh, the inclusion criteria of the, 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 the medication records were uh, they have to be at least 12 months of continuous therapy and pa patients will have to use at least two or more chronic prescription medicines. This we define the chronic prescription medicines as medicines that people have to use at least three months in a um, continuous way. We then proceeded to do a two-step cluster analysis on, on these on these records. From the initial sample of 280 uh, records that were that had some information that were possible to use, we only could identify 55 patients that fulfilled all these inclusion criteria, from which uh, the majority were female. The median age of these patients were 68 years old, and the median number of drugs used per patient was five. In the cluster analysis, we included these, these variables. So the severity of interactions uh, is, uh, is rated from no interactions to major interactions, and is given by the information system in the pharmacy. The, the severity of the contraindications is also given by the, the information system in the pharmacy. Uh, the number of, of drugs used, the BS criteria that we can apply knowing the age of the patient and the, 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 the drugs, and the, if the, the condition that the, the patient had uh, any measurable biomarkers, for instance, if he's a diabetic, it, it, we have to have the record on glucose measurement. If he has hypertension, we need the blood pressure, etc. So with this, <clears throat> we could identify four clusters and one, one outlier patient. This outlier patient really is a patient that should have been identified at the moment of the, of the dispensing medicine. So it shouldn't be here at all. This we, we identify as an outlier and we say that this patient has to be con contacted immediately to resolve a possible, a possible measure contraindication in their therapeutic. The other clusters were ordered mainly by number of drugs. So the higher the number of drugs, the, the more priority the patient had to be. And also by the, the grade of, this, uh, of the severity of contraindications and interactions. In the end, we couldn't identify these two clusters in the middle, so the second and third row as the, the patients that need a type 2A um, review. So they have to be called to the pharmacy or in some way identified when they go to the pharmacy the next time to for their dispensing and to go invite them to do this type A, type 2A medication review. 
And then the two final questions, just people that needed to, to be identified to collect some biomarkers and the others just to do a periodic medication type one review, maybe uh, using uh, only the medication records that is registered in the pharmacy. So in, in conclusion, we could identify these clusters using this methodology, of course, the, the 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 number of patients is too low, and we aim to to in future works to to apply it for a, a bigger set of of patients. And what we envision is the possibility of designing this algorithm and automating the algorithm in order to enable the pharmacist to receive alerts in the dispensing system when the patient goes to the pharmacist to to get the their new prescription. So, thank you. Thank you, Chua. Is it any questions from the? So thank you for this presentation. Um, you mentioned that you also uh, put biomarkers um, in there. So what can you mention some examples of biomarkers? Glucose, blood pressure, cholesterol, um, at least these three that are the most common. Also, you can have other physiological biomarkers like weight, BMI, uh, peak export, uh, expiratory flow. It really depends. In this case, this pharmacy had the possibility to measure all, but of course, this is a specific setting, a pharmacy that is doing these advanced projects of providing these services. Uh, so we had this possibility in this pharmacy. So the, the idea is to really identify who needs to measure these biomarkers. So we have this information. And with this information, we can then assess if the therapy, the therapy is useful or not, because that is one of the, the criteria from the medication reviews. Yes, thank you. The reason why I'm asking is I've been working on pharmacogenetics, and that would also be um, interesting to see in the medication review. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the idea. Joao, thank you. If I saw right, you have five or six factors that you use, or five, huh? Contraindic interaction, biomarkers, those five. My question is how did you select those five, five and not others? Why did you select those five and not others? Such as, such as what other, because these, these were the, 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 the information that we've got from the information system. Mm. So the pharmacy information system gives us this information. When someone goes to the pharmacy and I have the, their medication record, I can, when I'm doing the dispensing of the medicines, I get this information. The measurable biomarkers is in the patient uh, register, so I know if it is right, if he is or she is a hypertensive, hypertensive patient, I should have a record of their blood pressure. So, and I have the possibility to have this because these patients all have um, sign their consent to have that information in the pharmacy. For example, beers criteria, I hate beers criteria. <laughs> and I think I'm not the only one. <laughs> and the second input would be if it is 12 months of regular use of medicine, you have the claims data. So why not use a sort of possession ratio as one of your variables. Sorry, I didn't understand. So you have claims data, you have the dispensing data. If the, the, the inclusion criteria were that your patients must have been 12 months in this a continuous pharmacy. continuous in yes. this pharmacy, yes. So this means that you have dispensing data for these patients over 12 months. Mm -hmm. So one of your variable could have been how well or how good uh, the patients came to refill their uh, prescription. Yes, they, it could be. So that was my question. Why did you select those five and not others? 
because in this stage we wanted to verify if it could if we could do this clustering with this information mm. before starting to add the the data from measuring their adherence by knowing uh, how much time they are uh, with their medicines with their precision because we can calculate that using this data but of course if patients go to the other pharmacy i don't have that data so i can have a, a data in, pharma, in my pharmacy saying that this person is non-adherent but in reality she's not because she just went to other pharmacy and buy their medicine there yeah 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 it's just <laughs> we had... <laughs> anybody well, thank you so thank much you. <laughs> yes so now there is a break Five minutes break until 